<coughs> All right, well, this morning we have a, um, a shorter text, but it is one packed full of uh, differing things. So we're just going to take a small chunk. Uh, this evening we will take a larger chunk. Uh, because the genealogies really express just one main idea uh, in Luke's gospel, perhaps um, perhaps a little bit more than um, in, in Matthew's gospel, since it goes all the way back to Adam rather than back to Abraham. But let me read for you uh, our text in verses, uh, chapter th- Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 20. And let me just remind you, the main point I- here is why should we listen to Jesus. John gives to us essentially five reasons, but here's, here's the, uh, the passage. Uh, beginning in verse 15, now while the people were in a state of expectation and all were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he was the Christ, John answered and said to them all, as for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, And I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. But when Herod the Tetrarch was, re- was reprimanded by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the wicked things which Herod had done, Herod also added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. Well, may the Lord <coughs> bless uh, his word to uh, our building up in the Lord Jesus uh, this morning. Now, I just wanted to review uh, as we get started. I-, I like to review each time because I think we often forget. If, if I were to ask you, what did we look at last week? I don't know how many of us, I don't even know if I could really, uh, even though I spent a lot of time in the text, tell you what we looked at. Now, we may not be able to remember it, but when I tell you, you'll remember. And that's reminding you, just so that idea might stick a little bit longer uh, in, in your minds. Because remember, as Jesus talks about the gospel, the sower goes out to sow the seed and it falls in various soils. The seed that was sown by the wayside, the hard soil, it didn't penetrate, the birds came and they ate it up. That's the way it is with those who do not know the Lord. But those who know the Lord, the seed falls in good soil. The person holds on to it, understands it, applies it, lives it, and bears fruit. You see, that parable is reminding us of what we need to do with what we hear. So we need to try to hold on to these things. So let's um, let's see how much we've held on to. Uh, from last week. Now, remember last week, Luke gave us a a glimpse into Jesus' childhood. It's really the only one that we have in Scripture. And we saw several things from this. Again, things that are to be examples for us. We saw Jesus' desire to worship His Father uh, as man, worshiping God, Uh, even though uh, He wasn't required to attend uh, the Passover in Jerusalem, remember, uh, you didn't have to attend until you were 13 and went through your bar mitzvah, and he was 12. Jesus went anyway, and he stayed the whole seven days with his parents. Remember, only two days were required. Um, and then when his parents left, he stayed behind to continue to learn how to worship his father um, by staying in the temple. Uh, it tells us that Jesus' life was that of worship. From the very beginning of his life to the very end of his life. Now, this is what the Lord intended for us. This is the kind of life we were to live, but we failed to live. But this is the reason why God gave us his son, to live this kind of life so that he could clothe us with righteousness and give us the power to live this kind of life. Now, it's an example, but it was something he did in order to give us a spirit so that we, too, could do this very thing. We saw his desire to learn more, as I mentioned before, about his father and his will for our lives. Remember, Jesus, uh, as a man, did not have unlimited knowledge. He had to be taught, like everyone else, he had to learn. And so wanting to know more uh, 
about what was pleasing to his father, he stayed behind at the temple to learn from the teachers of Israel. Now again, Jesus gave us his Holy Spirit also to make a change in our lives, to give us the desire to read and to study the word of God so that we too would know how to honor him. And then the third thing we saw was his desire to do what he was actually taught. Remember, he returned to Nazareth. He continued in subjection to his parents, fulfilling the fifth commandment. He continued to honor his, his mother. I, I think it looks like Joseph died fairly early on before Jesus began his ministry. Uh, he continued to honor his mother even to the end of his life. And Jesus has given us his Holy Spirit also not only <clears throat> to learn what to do, but also so that we would want to do it, so that we would obey it. If we have the Spirit of God, we have the image of Jesus being formed in us. We, we have the desire to worship, to learn, and to obey. Now, last week, we also began looking at John's ministry. Uh, again, we're continuing that this morning. We saw his call. Very much like that of the Old Testament prophets, the Word of God came to John, and I think it was to show us that John was essentially the last of the Old Testament prophets. They were all pointing to Jesus, right? So he's the last one pointing to Jesus, and he is announcing the arrival of the great New Testament prophet, the one that all the prophets were pointing to. Uh, we saw where he ministered, which was in the wilderness at the Jordan, at the place where the Lord originally brought his people into the land. He was about to reveal his Redeemer uh, through this baptism, who would bring us into the land as well, only this time the true promised land and not just the picture of it in Palestine. Uh, we saw how John's ministry was meant to prepare God's people to receive Jesus. His preaching was meant to make inroads into their hearts so that when Jesus came, uh, they would receive him even as the Lord had promised through the prophet Isaiah. And we saw how John did this by preaching the law to expose their sins by warning them of the consequences of their sins, flee from the wrath to come, that's God's wrath for their sins, and by calling them to turn away from those sins and to receive the one who was coming behind him, the one who could save them. Now this morning we see John further preparing the people to receive Jesus by essentially contrasting himself with Jesus to show them how much greater Jesus is and why they should follow him. And he essentially gives five reasons. The first is because Jesus is mightier than John. Secondly, because he's of greater worth than John. Uh, thirdly, because he has a better baptism than John. Fourthly, because he has the authority to make the final separation between heaven and hell. And then fifthly, because his ministry will continue while John's was essentially on the way out. Now, first of all, John says that Jesus is mightier. Now, because of the power of which John preached and the popularity of his ministry, the Jews were beginning to wonder whether John was actually the Christ. You know, that's essentially what they're asking. Now, this was the last thing that John wanted. Remember, he didn't come to draw attention to himself. You know, we should never seek to draw attention to ourselves at any time, but rather to Jesus. He came to point the people to Jesus. Now, remember again who John was. He was a prophet. Jesus said, I say to you more than a prophet. Matthew 11, verse 11. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. But as great as John was, he was not the Messiah, okay? Jesus goes on to say in Matthew eleven eleven, 11, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. You know, while we were down in San Diego, I heard a sermon, well, we heard a sermon <clears throat> on this subject, <clears throat> and the way this was interpreted, as it's often interpreted, is that John wasn't in the kingdom. And even, even the, you know, anybody who is in the kingdom is greater than John even the least. But that's not what Jesus is saying here, is it? He is saying the one who is the least in the kingdom is greater than John. Not everybody in the kingdom, but the one who is the least in the kingdom is the one who is greater. The one who humbles himself 
to become the servant of all. He is the greatest in the kingdom. But who is that person who actually did that? Well, nobody has humbled themselves more than Jesus. Remember, being God, he became man. He became one of us. He took a nature infinitely below his. He who was rich became poor for our sakes. He came into this world not in the likeness of perfect humanity, but in the likeness of sinful humanity, though he was morally perfect. And he humbled himself to become a curse for us. He took the curse on himself when he was hanging on the tree. He took our place in God's judgment. He was thought accursed for our sakes. Jesus lowered himself to become the servant of all, so he is the greatest in the kingdom. I, ho I hope we understand this. I mean, John was in the kingdom. He wasn't standing outside the kingdom. Everybody who was in the Old Testament who believed in Jesus was a part of that, of that kingdom. This kind of thinking comes through dispensational thinking where it divides the people of God into two, two categories. But again, Jesus is the one that he is referring to here. Now, John then is comparing himself and his ministry with that of Jesus to show us how great he is and why we should follow him. In verse 16 of our text, we read this. John answered and said to them all, when they were wondering whether he was the Christ, as for me, I baptize you with water. But one is, is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the thong of his, sand, his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, first of all, John tells us that Jesus is mightier than he is. Now, I don't think that John here is talking about the, the might and power that Jesus has as God. He's not talking about his infinite strength. Of course, Jesus is mightier in that regard. But he is talking here about the power that Jesus has as a man to minister. Okay? His ministry is going to be much more powerful. Now, John was a mighty preacher. When he spoke, he did so in the spirit and power of Elijah, who was one of the greatest Old Testament prophets, one of the mightiest prophets, the one who withstood, remember, the, the, the prophets of Baal, the one who called down fire from heaven. Uh, Elijah's ministry was... was uh, full of miracles and, and very powerful. And because John ministered with this spirit, there were many who listened to him. This is what, uh, you know, basically turned to his popularity and why people were frightened into turning away from their sins. But John says Jesus was mightier and he would speak with even greater power because he was anointed with the spirit above measure. Remember, he was the one who comes from above and he speaks of what he knows from above. Those who, uh, well, John said the reason that Jesus speaks with such power, too, is because he is anointed with the Spirit above measure. Those who heard him realized Jesus had greater authority than their, their teachers, the scribes and the Pharisees. He, he speaks with authority and not like them. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees sent their officers and they asked these officers when they returned why they didn't arrest Jesus, they said in John 7, verse 46, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. Jesus' ministry was powerful, okay? Now, if John the Baptist were here, the greatest prophet of the Old Testament among those born of men, never has arisen anyone greater than John, except the one who was least in the kingdom, Jesus. Would we listen to John if he were preaching to us? Well, how much more should we listen to Jesus, who is mightier than John, who preaches to us and could actually, would actually preach to us every single day if we would care to open up his word and read it. Because here Jesus speaks to us and he speaks to us with power. Now secondly, Jesus is of greater worth. And by the way, going through five points, I'm going to have to just touch on these briefly. The main point is these are reasons why we should listen to Jesus. Secondly, John tells us Jesus is of greater worth worth. Now again, even though John was the greatest among men, or among the greatest of men, we might say, Jesus was even greater. John tells us that he didn't consider himself worthy even to stoop down and to loosen his, the, the thong of his sandals, the leather straps that hold his sandals on. He's not worthy even to do the, the menial task of a slave for the Lord Jesus. 
Now, this time in Jesus' life uh, is the time of his humiliation, of his humbling himself to become one with us in order that we might save us, but that should not lead us to believe that he was in any way inferior to us. He certainly was not. Even though he was in this state of humiliation, he was still far greater than any of us, far greater than John. We need to remember that Jesus, though he is a man, is a divine person. The personality in that human nature is a divine person, and so his value is off the charts. He's off the scale. Now that, by the way, is the reason why Jesus can save us, and only Jesus can save us, because only his worth, only his value can more than tip the scales of God's justice when, it's, when our infinite unworthiness is placed in the scales against us. You know, Jesus is the only one who could provide a sacrifice worth enough to save us. And so that's why we must look to him alone and look to no other Savior and not look to anything that we do but to what Jesus does alone. And by the way, this is also why we worship him. We worship Jesus because he is a divine person. To worship any, any, anything, any, anyone other than God is idolatry. And it's blasphemy and it's sin. But when Jesus was worshipped by his people, he received that worship because he is God in our nature. Just another reason to believe that. Don't let the devil shake that idea out of your mind. Because if you lose the divinity of Christ, you essentially lose salvation, the possibility of salvation. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Okay? Yet we have to believe he is Yahweh, that he is the covenant God of Israel, that he is the eternal one. But he's, again, he is the eternal Son of God, separate from the Father and the Spirit with regard to person, but they are one God. Now, thirdly, Jesus has a better baptism. John baptized with water, which was a symbol of repentance. You know, if, if you were uh, expressing, wanting to express the genuineness of your repentance, then submit yourself to this baptism of repentance, and that's essentially all that could do. But John says Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And that baptism of the Holy Spirit is what gives spiritual life. It's what raises us from the dead to life. It's what gives us the power to turn away from our sins, to repent, and truly to trust in the Lord Jesus, okay? Now, think about John. I mean, he was moving people, wasn't he, to turn from their sins and to submit to this water baptism. But they were moved only as far, we might say, as, as maybe John's ministry. Uh, those who were moved only by John and not by the Spirit of God eventually returned to their old ways, um, but those who were changed by the Holy Spirit never actually did. And this is simply to remind us that we can sometimes be moved by different people to do certain things. But unless the Lord is in it, it's not going to be a permanent change, okay? We need the baptism that Jesus gives. He's the only one who can give us that baptism. And he's also the only one who can give to us. Notice he says he will baptize with the Spirit and with fire. Some think that, that means he's going to save some and judge some, which is what we go on to see next. But I think what Jesus or what John means here by this is he's going to baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with a holy zeal by that Spirit to do his work and his will. Jesus is the only one who can give us the Spirit to give us the zeal we need to serve the Lord with our whole lives for our entire lives, okay? He makes a permanent change. John was, was really a temporary change, and unless the Spirit was in it, it really affected no change at all. So human preachers like John can inspire us, they can motivate us to serve the Lord for a little while, but never permanently, and that's why we need Jesus. Okay, if you don't know Jesus, if you're not firmly committed to Jesus, then you need to ask Jesus for His Spirit, because the Spirit of God is the only one who can give you the power to repent and believe and live for His glory. Now, fourthly, John says, the reason why you should listen to Jesus and not to me is because Jesus is the one who's going to make the final separation. 
Now, John's ministry had the effect, in a certain sense, of sorting through God's people and winnowing out those who were repentant from those who were not repentant, a separation that lasted again only as long as his ministry lasted, unless the Spirit of God was in it. But Jesus was coming to make a more permanent separation. And that's what John means in verse 17. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now here John is using a very familiar uh, image that, that people were aware of in an agricultural society, uh, that, that of a harvest after the farmer would um, basically gather in his wheat and they had these threshing sledges, I guess, that were dragged by animals across the wheat to kind of break it all up. And then the farmer would take his pitchfork and he would throw it up into the air, at least if there were a breeze, right? And the chaff would blow and the wheat would, the heavier wheat would fall and that's how he would separate the grain from the chaff. Well, John says Jesus is coming to preach the gospel so that those whom the Father has given to him might come to him. And those he hasn't given to him might remain unrepentant or become perhaps downright hostile. And as the wheat is gathered into the barn after it falls onto the ground, the chaff is, is blown away. Um, as this wheat is gathered into the barn and the chaff is burned up in the fire because the chaff is essentially worthless. So Jesus is going to gather his people together into his eternal kingdom, but he's going to cast the wicked into the eternal fire. This was the wrath that John was warning the people that they needed to run away from. Repent and receive the one who is coming because he is going to make this final separation. Now again, this is why we should listen to, to Jesus and to what he tells us in the gospel and why we should turn from our sins and trust in him and him alone because only he can save and because he's the one we're going to have to face as judge on the final day who's going to make that final separation. Now, if we listen to him now, today, at the day of salvation, we will enter into that kingdom. But if we refuse to listen, if we do not obey, as, as John told us in John chapter 3, then he will cast us away into a very real and eternal fire. That's what the Bible says. If there were no fire, if there was nothing that threatened, then there really wouldn't be any need for the Savior, would there? Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross. He died on the cross, and uh, that proves to us, as the table proves to us, there was a very real danger he was trying to save us from. So we need to listen to Jesus. Now, finally, the final reason is sort of implied here, but I, I think it is spoken out quite clearly in the text we read earlier in John chapter 3. Jesus' ministry would continue after John's came to an end. Once Jesus arrived, John's ministry, which was very popular at that time, began to decline. Now, it wasn't immediate. John would continue to teach. He would continue to preach and baptize but it would eventually be removed because his ministry was only preparation. It wasn't the final thing. That was Jesus. He was the final thing. Uh, we read in John chapter 3, verses 28 through 30, where John says of himself, You yourselves are my witnesses that I said. You know, I haven't been claiming to be the Christ. This is what I said. I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. And here are the important words, he must increase, but I must decrease. Okay, why should we listen to Jesus rather than uh, John? Well, because John was really passing off the scene. Eventually, we see that uh, John was arrested. He was arrested for publicly calling Herod out for his sins, among them adultery and incest. Uh, we read in Luke uh, 3, verses 19 and 20, but when Herod the Tetrarch was reprimanded by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the wicked things which Herod had done, Herod also added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. 
Now Herodias, remember, uh, was Philip's wife. Philip was Herod's brother. Herodias left her husband Philip and married um, Herod while Philip was still alive. Now, if Philip had died, Herod could have done that. But the fact that Philip was still living, he couldn't do that. We read in Leviticus 20, verse 21, where Moses writes this. If there is a man who takes his brother's wife, it is abhorrent. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. They will be childless. And yet on other occasions, if the brother dies, uh, he's to take his brother's widow and raise up a seed to his brother. Uh, there are other instances where he's supposed to marry his, his brother's wife, at least in the Old Testament, and that was for the purposes of the inheritance of the land, and thankfully, we don't have that particular law any longer, okay? But this, the important thing to see here is that what Herod did was sin. By the way, perhaps you'll recognize this verse as the grounds that Henry VIII, the king of England, was trying to use and actually succeeded when he broke away from the Church of Rome to <laughs> divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragon. You know, they were married for 20-some years, but she was not able to give him <clears throat> a, a male heir. Only in his case, <clears throat> his brother was dead, and so this marriage was lawful. So Henry uh, could lawfully marry Catherine. He should have stayed married to Catherine, but he didn't. Uh, and this was fallacious grounds in his, in his case, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. But in the case of Herod, he sinned against the Lord. Now, John's ministry, we know, was temporary. And he had to be moved out of the way so that those who were listening to him would begin to follow Jesus. Even after Jesus arrived on the scene, there were still those who were faithful to John. But John needed to be removed so that Jesus could become central so that they would begin to follow Jesus. Now, again, that's what we need to do. You know, we need to follow Jesus. We need to follow him. Um, you know, not just, think about this for a minute, not just barely, you know, not just weakly, not just hanging on, as it were, uh, sometimes wondering whether it's true or not, and never actually living for Jesus. We need to follow him with the kind of zeal that we see in John, the kind that is willing to pay the ultimate price, don't we? Isn't that what uh, Jesus essentially told us? That if we are to come after him, we need to pick up our crosses and follow him? What that means is we need to die to ourselves. We need to uh, sacrifice um, <coughs> whatever is important to us in life and give it all up for him, even our lives, even if it means we need to suffer and die. Now, last Wednesday, we were reminded that Athanasius, who was the, uh, the uh, a bishop, let's see, I, I don't remember exactly where, I think it was in Alexandria, that he was deposed and he was exiled from his country five times during his lifetime for standing up for the truth. Every time the emperors changed and it seems like they kept alternating between one position or another, every time the emperor's position didn't favor Athanasius, he was on his way out the door. He was exiled. But then when another emperor came in that favored his position, he would be brought back in. But Athanasius was willing to do that. As a matter of fact, Athanasius stood for the truth on, on every occasion to the point where his life was marked by that. So that on his tombstone, it was written, Athanasius against the world. The world was going to go the way the world was going to go, but Athanasius was going to take his stand on what Jesus said. And he was going to follow him no matter what the cost. Now, we see that in John, don't we? John went to prison. He went to prison because he spoke out publicly against uh, the sins of a public official who had the power to put him to death. But he was willing to do that because he wanted to honor God. So when John saw him, he didn't think, well, that's Herod. I better watch what I say because if I step on his toes, I'm going to get in trouble and I may have to go to prison. Maybe I'll die. But when he, saw, when he saw Herod, he said, you need to repent, okay? So that's the kind of zeal the Lord wants us to have, although in our case, not having a public ministry and not being a prophet, need to do it a little bit, perhaps a little bit more low-key, you know, maybe a little bit more relational if possible. But his ministry was that, again, of Elijah, a very powerful ministry. But the question is, are we willing to pay this price? Again, Jesus told us we have to be willing even before 
we begin to follow him. This is the price we have to be willing to pay. But this is also the price that the Lord gives us the ability to pay by his Holy Spirit. In our own strength, we'd never be able to do this. We'd never be able to let go of our lives or, or really any of our comforts or the things that we enjoy doing in order to serve the Lord. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can. So if we find within ourselves that we don't have that ability, we don't have that power, we're not willing to give those things up for the Lord, we need to pray and ask the Lord who gives the Holy Spirit and who gives fire. If we need salvation, we need to look to Jesus to give us that salvation. If we have Jesus, if we are saved but we're weak, we need to look to Jesus to fill us with his Holy Spirit and to give us the power to courageously stand for him even in the most difficult circumstances. By the way, an application of this would be standing in the, uh, you know, in, in the uh, uh, prayer vigil today, right? We should not withdraw because we're afraid of what people might think of us and what people might do to us. Uh, even if we are persecuted, spoken against, uh, somebody throws a rock at us or whatever, hopefully no bullets or anything dangerous like that. But if that should happen, then we're blessed, right? Because we're standing for the Lord <coughs> and we're being persecuted for it. But don't let it be for lack of courage that you go out there. Jesus is able to give you that courage. We need to look to him for the courage to do that as well as everything else that he calls us to do. Well, may the Lord help us to look to Jesus and to find in him everything that we need. Let's not look to any man, but look to Jesus. Every, every one of us is to be a signpost pointing to Jesus. Let's look to him for that grace and that strength. Let's um, bow for a moment of prayer, shall we, and ask the Lord to help us do that.